Okay, everyone. Hello, welcome to um, this month's seminar of the Hague Programme on International Cybersecurity at Leiden University's Institute for Security and Global Affairs. My name is Monica Kaminska. I'm an assistant professor of international security and technology at um, Leiden. Sadly, this is our last seminar of the academic year, uh, but we're really going out with a bang. I'm very excited uh, to introduce uh, this month's speaker, Kenneth Payne. Uh, Kenneth is a reader in international relations at uh, King's College London. He is also a former BBC journalist and the author of many articles and books, including The Psychology of Strategy, Exploring Rationality in the Vietnam War, and Strategy, Evolution and War from Apes to Artificial Intelligence. Today, Kenneth will be presenting his new book on artificial intelligence, also on artificial intelligence called I Warbot, The Dawn of Artificially Intelligent Conflict. And here it is, very much recommend it. Um, after Kenneth's talk, we will have an open discussion as usual in the form of a QA. and uh, a So Kenneth will speak uh, for about 30 to 40 minutes and then, um, and then we'll open up the floor to questions. We prefer that audience members pop their cameras on and ask the questions themselves, uh, but you can also use the chat function if that's more comfortable for you. Uh, so without further delay, Kenneth, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Monica, thank you very much. And hello from a, a hot and sweaty Shrivenham, which is the UK's Defence Academy. Uh, King's College London provides the academic support to the UK Defence Academy, which is what I'm doing here. Um, so if you hear any explosions going off in the background, that's the exciting part of the base where they uh, do lessons and such things. So don't be alarmed if my computer starts shaking. That's what's going on. Um, so I, I was planning on talking for maybe half an hour max, I guess, and then and then q and I always think the q and is the most interesting bit. Uh, and this was a really interesting exercise because it's uh, oh, coming up two years since the first edition of Warbot was published. I made some changes uh, last summer for the paperback edition. Uh, and two years is a long time in AI. It's a fast moving field, as you probably know. So. What I'm going to do in the talk, so 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 it's good. It's been good to look back actually and and see what I said two years ago and how much of that I still stand by. So uh, what I'll do in the talk is I'll I'll do it in three sections. What I said for those who haven't had a chance to um, have a look at the book. Uh, at section one, section two will be um, what's changed um, in the period since I submitted it, uh, and uh, and then in the final part we'll have a look at where we might be going. Uh, in terms of AI. And one thing that's changed is they promoted me, Monica. So it's, um, it's reader no longer. Um, so just clarify that for the sake of my mother. Who, who, who Sorry about that. <laughs> my YouTube videos. Um, so um, what I said two years ago, and actually it's nearer, nearer three, isn't it? If you've written a book, you know, it's an interminable wait between sending it off to the publisher and actually coming out. So three years is an absolute eon of time um, in AI research. Uh, and um, uh, there have been some important changes. We'll come to those, but let's just have a little look at what I um, what I said back then. And I'll canter through the sections in the book. I won't say too much about about uh, each one, uh, except for uh, um, the bit about strategy, which we'll get to. So the first thing I discovered when I was writing the book was that AI was a, a long-standing field of academic inquiry. The term dates to the 1950s. Um, but arguably it's it's older even than that. Uh, and um, for most of that history, there's been a very intimate connection between artificial intelligence and national security uh, in terms of funding, for one thing, um, but also in terms of the tasks that AI researchers were, were trying to achieve, whether that's encryption and decryption, image recognition, moving around uh, robotics uh, in a physical space, uh, a natural language translation. These are all tasks that have military uh, utility. Uh, and so unsurprising that the military was interested from the get-go. And I put this picture here on, on the screen and, and um, uh, uh, historical-minded uh, folks might know that's the V1, a German V1, um, I guess a cruise missile, you would call it in modern terminology, uh, used in the latter days of the Second World War to, to attack um, England. Uh, to my mind, not an artificially intelligent weapon system. And I unpick that a little bit in the book uh, and it helps me sketch out what I mean by AI. 
And for me, uh, the A bit's relatively easy, although not all that straightforward as we'll see in a sec, but the intelligence, the I bit is the interesting one. And, and the definition of intelligence I finally alighted on for, for the book was uh, of an agent, actor uh, that's able to respond sensibly or usefully to changes in its environment. Uh, so that's what intelligence is. It's all about action. That's why we evolve brains to detect what's going on in our environment, sense it and respond in a, a, a useful way to that. It's a nice, simple way. I found it a nice, simple way of thinking about it. And the V1 here doesn't, doesn't fit the bill because it can't detect what's going on around it. It's an automatic weapon system. You fire it and it's got a little impeller on the front that spins. And when it gets to a certain number of spins, it cuts out the engine and the thing falls out the sky. Um, so that's not an AI weapon system. But the weapon system that was used to defeat it, essentially, was and that was um, the, the the development of an integrated air defense uh, system that in particular used Doppler radar in the shells in the anti-aircraft artillery shells that were fired. So it's quite challenging to shoot down a fast moving thing. You have to aim in front of it and ensure that your projectile arrives at the same spot in the air that it does at the same time. It's computationally difficult especially in an era without electronic computers. But it was achieved to, to great effect and, and helped to defeat uh, the, the V1 threat by using analog computers, uh, ground-based radar, and then you'd compute on these analog systems a fire solution. You'd aim off and then you'd fire your shell. But the piece de resistance that arrived just in time was that the shell could detect, it had a proximity fuse that could detect when it was roughly in the same ballpark as the V1, and then it would explode. So you didn't actually have to hit it. You could get close and that was good enough. That's an AI weapon system, I argued in the book, because it is detecting what's going on in the environment and responding usefully. So an interesting example of the, the, the long-standing connection between national security and AI, and also a reminder that AI, if you define it along the terms I did, precedes uh, electronic computers. So that was the first thing I discovered. Um, the second argument I made in the book uh, was that AI, as we understand it today, has tactical utility. So uh, even if you froze all AI research today, and of course you're not going to, but if you did, you would still have uh, um, technologies that haven't yet been fully utilized that can have a dramatic impact in tactics and tactics uh, I see is a little bit along Clausewitz's lines as being close to the action. Um, it involves um, moving equipment around on the battlefield, supplying equipment and, and munitions, moving it around on the battlefield, coordinating, directing fire uh, to where you want to achieve uh, um, the maximum effect. And I think that's an ice cream van. Forgive me if you can hear that. Um, and and I. I I suggest in the book that AI has uh, tactical implications as it stands now, but also that we've not yet begun to see those, or we've only just begun to see those realized. We're in a sort of a, a wacky races phase of tactical AI development where militaries around the world are struggling to figure out what works best, what platforms should they develop, uh, what military um, organizations are best, do you need uh, different skill sets, do you need different people? Um, do you need different uh, doctrine for how you knit it together? The picture here is of uh, one of the British military's early uh, experiments in, in this field, an Andoril Ghost uh, autonomous helicopter used in a reconnaissance role. I believe they've also armed it with a, with a, light, a light weapon, but clearly it's a very lightweight platform, very um, short range, very tactical. So I spend a good deal of time discussing tactics and and um, and the implications of that. But for me, the main thing I wanted to get to in the book was this question of the extent to which AI can make a contribution to strategy. And I spend quite a lot of time talking about that. And that's my um, that's my area of academic expertise is the thinking about strategy and strategy is the higher level thinking about war. What do we want to achieve here? What do they want to achieve? How hard will they fight? How hard will we fight? What, will, what are we going to have to do over the longer term? These are complex, unbounded questions that are uh, orders of magnitude more difficult 
for humans and for computers than moving around on the battlefield and directing fire. And you'll know if you uh, have been at all interested in AI for the last few years, what's going on in this picture here. This is Lisa Dole playing Go against DeepMind's AlphaGo algorithm. It's a great documentary. If you, if you haven't seen it, you can watch it on, on YouTube. Um, Go is a, a, um, a, an Asian board game uh, originally now played worldwide. Um, that is deceptively simple looking, but hugely complicated. As, as is often said of Go, uh, there are more possible combinations of moves on that board than there are atoms in the universe. So that makes it a tricky problem for a computer, even a powerful computer, to solve using what's called brute force calculation alone. So this board game was uh, um, put up against an AI in 2017. All the expert Go players said... Um, it's, it wasn't it, it wasn't a game that the computer would um, would beat the world champion at, uh, and spoiler alert, it handsomely did. So that to me was a, that was happening just as I started writing Warbot, and was an illustration uh, I thought of the potential for AI to be more than a, um, a an autonomous weapons platform. It's still what computer science researchers call a toy universe. It, clearly, that's much more complex though it is, it's much more simple than the real world. You know, there are well-regulated moves on that board. It's a neat, uh, um, very simplified reality that the computer has to deal with, much more simplified than, than waging war against another country. So the question is how applicable are, are what we know about what the machine is doing there to the wider world uh, and what changes uh, machines are making to allow them to deal with those more complex realities. I'll say some more about that. Uh, in just a second. Um, but the idea was that AI can make a contribution to strategy, and I spent a bit of time unpicking that. And the, the first thing I said was that AI uh, can help human strategists understand what's going on in the world um, uh, by uh, passing mountains of uh, information and data and figuring out what's important, what might help them in their decision making, by uh, simulating reality, by producing models of what happens in the real world that allow human decision makers to rehearse the sorts of things that they want to do. Uh, and you may have heard the term digital twins uh, used to describe that. Uh, and then finally, by actually getting involved in the decision making themselves as part of a, a human machine team, probably uh, working almost as a red team within a decision making group to help overcome some of those um, shortcomings that groups of humans have when they get together to decide things, uh, things like group think or confirmation bias, the machine can help challenge uh, some of those. So I unpicked, I unpicked those areas in which I thought AI was starting to make a contribution to strategy. And then I also looked ahead to a more expansive role for uh, AI in strategy. And, and when I was writing, I had my hands on GPT-2, uh, and some of you may have used OpenAI's chat GPT, which is uh, GPT-3, or you may even have used GPT-4, um, which is available in, in um, uh, invitation-only uh, mode. Um, and you'll know what I'm talking about. This is an algorithm that generates realistic-looking prose. Um, the question for me back in GPT-2 days when I was writing Warbot was, to what extent is this an illustration of AI doing more than playing a board game? Is it being creative? Does it have a grasp of meaning um, arrived at through its use of language? It certainly wrote passable haikus uh, and poetry, um, but did it really understand what it was doing? Uh, and my conclusion was uh, not yet, but here's a tantalizing glimpse of a future where AI can demonstrate ingenuity, intuition, very human seeming um, traits. Uh, and we'll come back to some of those later on. And then the last thing I looked at on strategy uh, was um, the future of computing. When we think about the A bit of artificial intelligence, the artificial part, I think we spend most of our time uh, imagining something running on a computer, what computer scientists call a von Neumann machine, which is the basic architecture, the basic structure of a computer, which is unchanged since John von Neumann uh, um, came up with it in the 1940s and early 1950s, Alan Turing similarly. This is the, the, the essential structure of a computer. It, has, it deals in bits, binary numbers. It shuttles information between a processor and memory. Uh, and it looks like the laptop or the smartphone 
that we're all very familiar with. But uh, I wanted to think about other forms of architecture that might justify the term artificial. Um, uh, so I started by looking at other ways of constructing computers, quantum computers, neuromorphic computers. These are technologies that are with us now, but nascent, um, but increasingly mature. Uh, but then I looked um, and I was most interested in um, at the field of biocomputing, the, the nexus between uh, biotechnology and artificial intelligence, uh, gene editing, creating uh, chimeras, uh, which is mixing genes from one species into another. These sorts of science fiction seeming um, ways in which you might dream up new uh, artificial systems on which to run your intelligence. And we'll return to those in the second part in a moment. But one quote that I had in the book that I really liked was from a French defense minister who they, they had just passed a piece of legislation talking about augmented uh, intelligence and the work that they were prepared to do in France in the military on that. And she said, uh, we're, we're going to do Iron Man, not Spider-Man. And so for fans of Marvel Universe, which emphatically isn't me, um, the distinction was between, uh, you know, a bolt on system that you would strap an exoskeleton or uh, even a, a, a brain reader that you would strap onto the outside of your body or even a, a metal implant that you would put in your body. That would all be Iron Man. But Spider-Man would be messing around with your genes to produce something different. Uh, and I explored a little bit of that. And what was interesting about that research, this is pre-COVID, by the way, was just how much of the cutting edge research in that biotechnology sphere was being done in China. Because I suspect in large part, France uh, and other countries, we're gonna do Iron Man, but not Spider-Man, but not everybody sees things the same way. So that was an interesting discussion to have uh, about architectures and the artificial. I won't spend much time on this, but it's, it's just a, uh, it's an extension of the strategy bit, the points I've just been making. I wanted to explore what AI meant for strategic studies theory uh, for um, terms of art there, like compellence, deterrence, uh, and escalation. Uh, and the example I used here was uh, this one. This is Jaguar Land Rover's experiment with autonomous cars. My, my uh, friends were forever asking me, where's my autonomous car? And it's still not here, right? They, we have lane control, but, but that's about it. Uh, and the problem is less one of sensing technology. It's less the tactical problem of sensing the environment and maneuvering within it safely if you're a civilian car or to more accurately direct violence if you're a military machine. It's less the tactical problem. It's more the strategic problem of gauging other minds in the environment and responding sensibly to them. Thomas Schelling is a famous strategic studies scholar, uh, and he um, argued that uh, a lot of strategic problems look a bit like traffic problems. You're jockeying at the junction in busy traffic, trying to gauge who's doing what. Well, I remember my Schelling when I saw this experiment. Um, Jaguar Land Rover here decided that the best thing to do to tackle this problem was to put cartoon eyes on the front of the car that would track the humans. So as you approach the curb or the zebra crossing, the eyes would flick towards you. Now that's not about detecting, the car has a radar for that. It's about communicating. Uh, it, it, it's a way of um, faking what we humans instinctively do, which is mind reading, getting inside other people's minds through empathy and theory of mind. Uh, and that's an important element of strategy, I argued, that machines don't have. They can't gauge what other minds are thinking. So the cartoon eyes were a way of trying to shortcut to get around that. They're communicating to the human, danger, don't step out. Uh, and I spent a bit of time on picking how you might extend that into the, the military national security realm. But I think the, uh, the, the fundamental problem is that communication is only half the battle here. There's also a bit about uh, genuinely imagining what the adversary in the national security sense or the pedestrian in the traffic sense is thinking, genuinely getting inside their mind. And I remembered another bit of strategic studies uh, um, literature, Sun Tzu, he famously says, know yourself and know the enemy and you won't be defeated. And it's that mind reading that I suggested was the missing bit when it came to artificial intelligence.
So that's uh, broadly speaking. Oh, uh, the last one I just skipped over inadvertently. The last chapter of the book is about what most of the debate, you know, most of the discussion in national security AI is about regulation and the dangers of killer robots and all the rest of it. Uh, and um, so I thought I'd better address some of those issues. And for what it's worth, I'm a regulation skeptic. Um, I think arms control for AI is going to be extremely difficult um, for various reasons. Perhaps unpick that in the Q&A. Um, and I think the analogy that's often made to nuclear weapons is of limited utility. Nuclear weapons have been regulated reasonably successfully, debate, um, but there are some very profound differences between nuclear weapons and artificial intelligence that I think are going to uh, militate against regulation. So that was the book, and that's what I said. What's changed in the period since I wrote it? Uh, I mean, plenty. Um, when I wrote it, um, I made reference to GPT-2 as a form of creativity. This was a transformer model, GPT-2. All these language models are transformer models, generative AI, sometimes called. Uh, and this famous picture of the Pope in his puffer jacket looking very stylish. I hope somebody's actually got him the real thing um, by now. Uh, it's, a, um, it's an example of the same technology, a transformer AI, a type of deep learning AI that was only really uh, uh, invented in 2017 as I was writing. So this is a new technology that's underpinned a lot of these uh, developments. And in the six years since then, of course, it's become much more sophisticated. It's run on much uh, more powerful computers um, and algorithms have been tweaked and developed and better understood. And the results, I think, attest to themselves. So the question is, my tentative thoughts about creativity, I think, are on steroids now. We have uh, a, a lively and ongoing discussion uh, about what sort of uh, creativity is possible with AI. For me, the, the part of that discussion that I'm most interested in gets me back to that Jaguar Land Rover car. And it's about this business of mind reading, know yourself, know your enemy, uh, and you won't be defeated. Uh, and I am uh, uh, enthralled by research papers that are coming out literally on a week by week basis that test this stuff. So, for example, there was one a month or so ago uh, from Stanford University on GPT-4 that gave GPT-4 a battery of psychological tests, theory of mind tests of the sort that you would ordinarily give, a uh, development psychologist would ordinarily give to young children to see whether they're developing uh, neurotypical ability to mind read, to empathize, to understand that other people can have false beliefs. And GPT-4 sailed through that test. Or there are uh, a series, uh, one I was reading just this morning, actually, if you prime the AI uh, with anxious seeming words, anxious adjectives, you can affect its decision making in a subsequent task in a, in a way that, that tracks nicely what happens to humans if you make them more anxious. Typically in the psychology literature, if you make somebody anxious, they become more risk averse uh, in, in whatever the exercise is. A and GBT4, the same. Um, so I'm interested in this uh, deeper exploration of the extent to which language, which is what these things are specialized in, tracks meaning uh, in the world. And I'm spending, this is what I'm working on for the next book. I'm spending uh, a bit of time reading my Wittgenstein and um, trying to wrestle with similar issues to what linguistic philosophers have been doing for a very long time about the extent to which language captures reality uh, and uh, is it, an important component in our conscious deliberation about other minds. So that's definitely changed, and I find that quite interesting. This is a really interesting example of that in practice. One of the uh, lesser known geniuses of the last 10 years is a guy called Noam Brown, who's worked now, I think, for most of the, the top AI companies currently at DeepMind, I believe. He uh, was part of the team that came up with, as I was writing Warbot, uh, came up with a, a poker winning AI. If you play poker online for all sorts of reasons, but this in particular, I suggest you stop um, because AI is now able to beat uh, world-class poker players at poker. That's uh, of interest to strategists because it's a hugely complex game of asymmetric information that involves a, a high degree of you know, luck and chance 
in determining the outcome. Clausewitz said that war is most like a game of cards. And he was thinking of poker when he made that analogy. So back in 2018, uh, Noam Brown and his team produced a, uh, a brilliant uh, poker playing algorithm called Librasis. Uh, it didn't engage in any mind reading. Uh, it, it sought out for the mathematically minded people in the room, it sought out the Nash equilibrium in a game of poker and it just did so more effectively than world-class poker players. World-class poker players now are generally less interested in mind reading. They generally, I'm told, try and do more what the computer does, which is figure out what the Nash equilibrium, the optimum hand to play is. But classical poker players was all about trying to gauge what's going on in your opponent's mind. I know that you know, know yourself, know your enemy. Anyway, no mind reading involved in Libratus. But this game here for the real dweebs in, in the room uh, is called Diplomacy and it's, uh, you know, it's a game of world conquest. What's interesting about Diplomacy a multiplayer game, it mixes that structured board game with uh, a natural language element. You have to bluff the other players into thinking you'll cooperate with them or you have to try and form an alliance with them. There's a degree of persuasion involved in in diplomacy that isn't involved in poker uh and cicero the algorithm that known brown and the team at meta facebook developed was able to achieve world-class level performance in online diplomacy tournaments um, by combining the sort of poker playing tactical uh um algorithm with a language model that would do the communicating with the human players. So that's really interesting. That's a development since Warbot that extends more concretely AI into this strategic domain. We're a long way there from uncrewed platforms moving around the battle space and firing stuff. So that's been a change. Um, a couple more, and then I'll, I'll uh, pause for questions. Um, this is Sam Altman of OpenAI, and I have him here. This is him talking in Congress a couple of weeks ago, and there's been a, a lot of discussion in the media. Perhaps you've seen some of it about regulation of AI and the companies at the forefront of this language model technology have been calling for AI, and there's been much discussion of, of so-called AI doomster existential risks um, from AI. The whole thing has become much more mainstream. And you know, I'm riding that 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 particular like like other people who've been thinking about these issues for a few years. We're riding along on that that wave of AI being much more mainstream, but it's been striking the extent to which everything has become about AI uh, in the course of um, in the course of the last the last couple of years. Um, and uh, my particular view on that um, regulation is going to be extremely hard. Um, domestically, I can see regulation being um, more straightforward, not easy, because, you know, you have to find a way of aligning AI to your values. And that means you have to find a way of pinning your values down in a way that the algorithm can understand. That's hard. Um, but internationally, it's even harder because of the security dilemma, the fear that other countries are developing AI and that they're not going to play by whatever rules. Um, you cook up. So that regulation issue is more mainstream. And we see it, for example, in the Netherlands. I was at a conference uh, recently with Monica, the REAIM conference sponsored by the Dutch government to discuss exactly this sort of norm formation around militarized AI at the intergovernmental level. So there's work ongoing, but I'm a little skeptical about the prospects um, for that work. So there's Sam. A final thing I... I'd say one more thing I'd say about uh, AI since I wrote the book is that uh, I've been, I, I've committed the classic forecasting error, which is that I was overconfident about the short range changes from AI. And I believe under um, enthused about the long range, I've become much more, um, I've become much more inclined to the view that AI is a radically different technology than I was when I started writing Warbox. I had that sort of ingrained cynicism. It's just a computer, garbage in, garbage out. It's just doing statistics at a large scale. I think I'm much more um, persuaded about the emergent effects of, um, 
current AI technology. And what's the long range implications of AI are, I believe, very profound, including in the military national security domain, but um, more broadly than that, uh, at, at the level of, of what it means to be a state, a government, an individual within a society in a world of AI. I think the long range implications are profound, but I overcook the short range implications. The picture here is of the RAF's next generation combat aircraft, the Tempest it's called. And the first thing you notice about it in this very stylish drawing is that it's got a cockpit. And, um, you know, we bureaucracies do their thing, as Robert Comer wrote uh, of the American bureaucracy in the Vietnam War. There are ingrained cultures that work to shape and filter the way in which technologies are adopted and the way in which those technologies shape uh, organizations and societies. Uh, and I'm guilty, even though I wrote about the dangers of it, I think I'm guilty a little bit of the technological determinist view that the technology drives all before it. Um, the cockpit in Tempest is a useful reminder to me here that there are other factors in play than the technology itself. Uh, a last point uh, here, this is the Ukraine war, and it's obviously become um, a highly technological in some respects. Uh, conflict, uh, where we see the, the ubiquitous use of uncrewed drones, particularly. That's probably the most dramatic change in combat that's emerged as a result of this war, uh, uncrewed technology uh, in the air. It's not necessarily AI. There is AI involved in the Russia-Ukraine conflict, but it's more in the back office. It's more doing that intelligence analysis kind of stuff that, where it's been involved for years. There are no uh, uncrewed combat aircraft or uncrewed uh, ground systems, or not many of them anyway, um, in Ukraine. So uh, a, a, another reminder to me here that even if the technology seems profound, uh, we're still in the foothills of its adoption by national militaries. Okay, last thoughts, and there are only a couple here of what's coming next. Um, I alluded to this already. This is a quantum computer. I've become a little bit dweebly obsessed with quantum mechanics over the last few years. Um, and um, quantum computers are a little bit like nuclear fusion. Uh, there's a slight element of the boy who cried wolf. People have been talking about quantum computers becoming a usable, mature technology for so long that we almost discount them. Uh, it'll never happen. I think we're at a point where you're starting to see practical use of quantum computing, 400 qubits in, in IBM's most recent processor. So I think... Uh, the, the bit where I was talking about new architectures uh, for AI, I think quantum computing and to a lesser extent neuromorphic chips are a part of that. Uh, and they are, uh, if not here now, uh, coming into view. Uh, and then the last one, this is a, again, a different architecture. Um, this is fascinating. So what first got me interested in AI 12 years ago uh, was Google Brain's um, use of deep learning um, to recognize cats on the internet. And soon afterwards, uh, DeepMind's use of deep learning to conquer Atari video games. I spent the 1980s playing Atari video games. Uh, and in 2012, DeepMind published a paper where a computer had achieved superhuman level performance on Atari video games. I was like, well, something's going on here. Um, I was pretty good at Space Invaders, but not this good. Well, flash forward 10 years now, just over, and this is a couple of months ago, and what you can see here is an absolute classic video game on the left, a game called Pong, which is the first video game I ever had. That's the one where the bat and ball move up the side of the screen and the ball moves between the two and you try and keep the ball in play. Um, on the right is a Petri dish. And in the Petri dish are neurons, um, cultured neurons. I don't know whether they were going from stem cells like the embryo that's in the news today, but they're cultured uh, neurons. So they are real neurons forming an artificial neural net. And that artificial neural net achieved decent level of gameplay in Pong. So I put this here by way of illustrating the biocomputer part uh, of the A in artificial intelligence. A lot of the limitations on AI, where people say, oh, it's not going to think like a human, it's not emotional, it's not capable of empathy, are connected to our biology. And this is a reminder that not all computers are dead. Some of them are made from biology. And if you start making artificial intelligence from biology, either by culturing it in a dish or by genetically modifying uh, real life organisms, um, then some strange things are possible. And from my mind, at least, 
that's where we're going next over the course of the next 10 years or so. Um, so there you go. That's um, that's hopefully a little bit of an oversight as to my little journey through AI. I hope you found it useful and interesting. Uh, and um, and if there are any questions, happily take them. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Ken. Uh, that was really, really fascinating. And I love how you gave uh, an overview of, of the book and also the section at the end of the second edition where you discuss uh, more recent developments.